most of us, we think back to that time that our parents packed our backpack with markers and crayons and pencils and sent us off on a school bus for the first time ever and we showed up at kindergarten and we were ready to learn. And for some of us, it goes back a little bit further than that. Maybe it's the first time we ever figured out what a school bus was. Or maybe it was the first time we saw that yellow thing and heard the word bus and made a connection between those two things. What we're finding, though, is that, that recent research is showing that, that our brains are developing much, much earlier than that. That nearly 85% of your brain is developed by the time you're 36 months old. For an average toddler, 2 million synapses are developing per second in that child's brain. So if you, if you look at this, what you see are these, these connections between the word we see and the thing we think of. The sound we hear and the word bird are all being developed during those, during those really critical, critical early months. The question is really, if you were in charge of moving 100 tons of freight down a roadway, would you prefer to move that freight down a, a deserted rural road, or would you rather move that freight during an infrastructure like we might see in a, in a major city? And obviously, the, the answer is the major city because there's, there's more infrastructure there. Things can move faster. They don't have to wait for the next thing to get off the ramp before it's their turn. We move at a faster rate. And that, that all is great theory. And then we have William. And William is our 20-month-old now, and this was the, the first, this was the most appropriate first picture that we could find to send of him. And, and, and for, for Hedrick and I, this is a real challenge, right? Because I am the director of First Steps. My job is to make sure that children in Greenville County enter school on track. My wife, who's here tonight, is a 4K teacher with a master's degree in early childhood. So if a baby was ever destined to succeed, it should come from our house. And when we found out we were having William, we had the same thoughts that every other parent has. So what are we supposed to do, right? And then we started looking at all the stuff that, that people claim help babies learn. And we looked at the DVDs, and we looked at the music, and we looked at the games, and we looked at the puzzles. We looked at the things that you could strap to her belly so that we could play Beethoven before he was born, and he would know what it is when he magically came out into the world. And, and we found that this stuff is really complicated. And we found there's not a whole lot of research that says that any of this stuff really makes as much a difference as a few very, very simple things. And so what I wanted to talk about tonight were what we found research shows are the two most effective things in making sure children enter school on track. So we look at a couple of typical houses, and I want you to think of two families both having babies about the same time. So we will call one baby Gabby and one baby Michael, and Gabby and Michael both are gonna come home to, to these homes. Now their, their families are both emotionally stable and financially stable. Gabby and Michael come from homes where parents understand what they're supposed to do. And so when Gabby and Michael come into their homes for the first time, we see something different happen. They both work down the street, and so Gabby's dad and Michael's dad can walk home each afternoon. And, and at about 4.30 in the afternoon, they come home from a day's work, and both of their moms, the lad to hand the baby off, meet them at the door, toss the baby, and then head back into the further part of the house. And, and here's something different happens. Michael's dad sits down on the couch, puts on a sweatshirt, and he and the baby watch a little television, Maybe they tickle each other, but they, they're basically hanging out on the couch watching TV. But Gabby's dad does something a little different. She has a basket by the couch with some books. And Gabby's dad brings out the books, and Gabby chooses the book that she wants. And they read these books for about 15 minutes a day. If you stop time here, something profound is happening. 15 minutes a day, that's all it takes. If Gabby is read to 15 minutes a day, from the time she is born to the time she enters kindergarten, Gabby will have one to two million more words exposed to her than Michael. One to two million more words in 15 minutes a day. Now some of you may think, but there's no way there's one to two million more words in the world than, than what Michael's exposed to. Last night we were reading to William, and one of the stories that he likes right now is a story about a monster that's not his monster. And it's a 
called Not My Monster, and he knows it's not his monster because each page shows him there's something else wrong with that monster. One monster is too prickly, one monster is too ticklish, one monster is too fluffy, one monster is way too fur. I will never, in a typical day with William, use the words prickly, tickly, fluffy, or fur. But William will hear those words every single night that he picks up that book. When you think about words like violet, and oyster, and seashore, words that we never use where we live, but children hear those words, and they see a picture, and they make a connection. When you go back to those roadways, those, those pictures and those connections are what's going to make a difference. One to two million more words makes a difference. And the difference is, when Gabby enters kindergarten, she will actually have a larger vocabulary than Michael's parents. I'll say that one again. So when Gabby enters kindergarten, after being read to 15 minutes a day, she will have a larger vocabulary than Michael's parents, just from those 15 minutes a day. So we know that's one, one success. But there's another one. So Gabby and Michael's parents both also have a stroll. And Gabby and Michael's parents both also moved to Greenville, not knowing a whole lot of people. So they don't have family in the area. Their neighbors are pretty friendly, but they don't hang out together. When Michael's mom goes for a walk, she usually goes by herself, and she walks around the street, and we look at the leaves, and we look at the trees, and we talk about life. But Gabby's mom actually found a church down the street, and that church has a Mother's Morning outfit. One day a week, one hour a day, Gabby's mom gets to go into the church, drop her baby off in the nursery, and go have a cup of coffee. And that cup of coffee is going to be as profound in changing the life of that baby as those books are. What we find is that children <coughs> who are able to take a break from their parents has a profound effect on the parent's ability to cope with stress. And that mom being able to talk to another mom will open doors to her to help her realize that she's not a terrorist, that these things happen. These things happen to us. And I'm going to show you what we're going to do. This is William. This picture here on the left was taken uh, when William was uh, realizing that it was 4.30 in the afternoon. And for some reason, every afternoon at 4.30, for about six months, William realized that there was something wrong in the world. The problem was William's mom and dad never figured out what it was. And every day when I came home from work, William was there, upset about something. And the only thing we could figure out to make it work was if we put William in a stroller and we walked down the street. It didn't make him stop crying, but it got him out of the house. And when he was out in the noise of the streets, it drowned out the baby scream. <laughs> So dad and monster baby walked around our block every day, and you could hear the neighbors batting the hatches, locking the doors, hiding back in the kitchen, telling their children not to go outside until the crazy baby got down the street. And one day, one of the dads down the street came out. I don't know why. I think he may have gotten locked out of the house before we got near him. Came up and, like a baby whisper, reached down and rubbed William on the back of his neck. And he stopped crying. I was in love with this man. <laughs> and he told me that that's okay. These things happen. Apparently, there is something that no one ever told me about called the witching hour, where babies just get mad. And it has nothing to do with them being hungry or sleepy. It has nothing to do with them being mad or needing their diapers changed. They just aren't happy with life. But I had not heard that. And what I also hadn't heard was that I wasn't doing anything. And so as a parent, to hear that sometimes these things just happen is better impact than any of the trainings you could possibly send a child parents to. Some of the research also shows that parents who are able to find other parents develop a social network that allows them to cope with stress. What we know is that if you look at children who test not ready by third grade, the single greatest common factor of all those children is their parents' ability to cope with stress. The presence of abuse, neglect, or toxic stress in a home is the single greatest predictor. 53% of all children in South Carolina who tested not ready by third grade came from a home where there was abuse, neglect,
toxic stress present in the home. These families are missing coping skills. They're missing the ability to draw connections between what's happening in their home and what happens in every other house with a baby everywhere else in the world. Children are born with it. And we know that there are two things that can make a difference, and they cost less than $15 a family. For $10 a family, we could put 10 books in every home in Greenville. For $10 a family, we can make sure that every child had access to books to make sure that they had resources so that they could read to their children on a regular basis. For less than $5 a family a year, we can develop Mother's Morning Out programs at other facilities where parents can develop coping skills to help them learn how to deal with stress. If you compare that to the cost of retention for one year, it's $10,000. So for every time we hold the child back in public schools, it's approximately $10,000. Last year, we held back about 280 children in Greenville County Schools. If we could reduce that number by 50, just by 50, we could save half a million dollars that could be used towards long-term changes within our community. We could put smart boards in every school. We could put <coughs> iPads in every child's hand for the cost of keeping 50 children from having to be held back. For $15 a family, we could, we could change this community. And not just in a generation, we could change our community in seven years. Because by the time they got to third grade, they'd be testing so far ahead of their peers and the rest of the state that we'd be able to continue to move that needle forward. So within one generation, we could have children graduating from school on time. We could be working towards eliminating poverty in Greenville County for $15 if every family read to their child 15 minutes a day, if every family had one person they could turn to, they could change their